Hi, my name is Lindsay Black, and I'm one of the co-chairmen of the Dublin Lawrence St. Patrick's Festival. This year would have been our 56th annual St. Patrick's Festival in Dublin, Georgia. Although we were unable to celebrate together due to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, we wanted to keep the spirit of the festival alive by sharing some of the memorable events and history through the years. These are the unique stories that make up our festival. And so today I have with me two remarkable women who are gonna share some of that history. I have with me Mrs. Shirley Miller. She has been active for many years in the Dublin Lawrence community. She is a member of First Baptist Church of Dublin. And her and her husband Wallace have three children, eight grandchildren and three great grandchildren. Mrs. Miller is also a 1986 Woman of the Year recipient and a 2018 Amy Cannon Spirit of the Festival Award recipient. I also have with us today, Mrs. Harriet Claxton. She's been active for over 90 years in the Dublin Lawrence County community. She is a member of First Baptist Church of Dublin, and she is a 1979 Woman of the Year recipient. And she's also a member of the Dublin Lawrence Historical Society, a frequent columnist for the Courier Herald newspaper, and she has two children and six granddaughters. Thank y'all so much for joining us today to share these stories. And so Mrs. Miller, I wanted to kick it off with you to just share with us how this festival began over 50 years ago. I know it was born out of, out of an idea in a break room. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Absolutely, Lindsay. I never tire of telling how the Dublin Lorraine St. Patrick's Festival all began. And I'm delighted to share with you its history as recorded by Anne Everly, who became the first festival's historian even before the festival began. But first, let me thank you and Brian Nash, co-chairs of this year's festival for all of your efforts in keeping the festival spirit alive during these difficult times. As you said, Lindsay, the festival was a vision of folks in the break room at WMLT radio station. Richard E. Dick Killebrew had come to Dublin in 1958 from WDAK in Columbus, Georgia, where he was voted the most popular radio personality in town. Wow. Anne Everly had returned to Dublin with sweet three small children to begin her career at WMLT as well. Today, she would probably be called the marketing director. She went into banks and businesses and solicited ads for the radio. In the fall of 1965, Dick Killebrew said that he was tired of just telling Irish jokes and playing Irish music during the week of St. Patrick's. He wanted more. He went to the station manager, Ed Hillian, with the idea of a festival. I love his answer. Dick told Anne that Mr. Hilliard didn't cotton to the idea at first and still did not for several urgings. But when the Irish bug was caught by the entire staff of WMLT, he relented and said yes. And Everly told that the entire staff would go into frequent huddles planning the strategy to win public approval, but this was no problem because Killebrew and Hilliard as they reached out to the community for feedback and the idea was received with excitement from civic clubs and businesses and the Chamber of Commerce. And at that time, W.H. Champion, editor of the Dublin Courier Herald, was contacted and asked to join as a co-founder of the festival and he readily agreed. Then Christmas of 1965 put the idea on hold until early 1966. On January 31st, 1966, a St. Patrick's Festival Planning Committee meeting was held and 19 organizations were represented. Mr. Killebrew addressed the crowd with this, people make or break a town. Well, Dublinites and Lawrence Countyans have proven they were there to make a town. Wow. With the festival being born of media gurus, publicity soon reached New York City, Chicago, Savannah, and even CBS Good Morning America. But before telling you of all the events that Harriet will tell us, of the first festival in 1966, let me continue with a little further history. The first two years were chaired, as I said, by the two co-founders, Ed Hilliard and W.H. Hilliard and Champion. These two guys then approached Chuck K. Billings, 
who was Chief of Volunteer Services at the VA Medical Center, to chair the third year. Chuck took the festival to the people, which is when a steering committee was named. Charles Bass was the next general chairman and chose the theme, Forward Together. This continues to be true. The next year, 1970, John W. Hambrick was chair and John Ross was vice chair. And they saw that the festival needed some more funds and more members participating. So that is when the Order of Shillelagh began. Wow. With 67 charter members, the first president, Cecil Passmore, Jr. The next year, 1971, the Order of the Blarney Stones was organized with 61 charter members under the leadership of Louise White. That year, a wee bit of Ireland in Georgia was selected as the permanent St. Patrick's logo theme, however we say it. Hi, this is Cameron Curry with Kim Barham, and we're the vice chairs of the 2021 Dublin Lawrence St. Patrick's Festival. We would like to thank the Dublin Lawrence community and all of our sponsors, patrons, vendors, and civic organizations for their continued support of the Dublin Lawrence St. Patrick's Festival through the years. It's because of your financial support each year that allows us to celebrate our great city. Erin Gobra. The City of Dublin Natural Gas provides the most cost-efficient source of energy available today. So for your home, choose the most natural resource. Safe, clean, efficient. All new subdivisions around the Dublin area have natural gas available. Start reducing your energy bills today with Dublin City Natural Gas Department. Natural gas, the smart choice. Call 277-5048 today and let us help you start saving today. Lovely and talented Edna Champion. Yes. Was a 1971 right honorary <laughs> lived right over there. Was a 1971 honorary leprechaun, but she was wife of one of the two founders, okay. W. H. Champion, and she was president of a teachers society, okay. Kappa Chapter Delta Kappa Gamma, in 1971. So she volunteered to her husband that our teacher's little group and the Toastmasters mm -hmm. would host the luncheon for out-of-town guests here at the Dublin Country Club. Now, mind you, it didn't fill the ballroom. It was in the early beginnings, and it filled one of these rooms, the terrace or the magnolia room. But they had many, we had many excited guests, and that is when the teacher's hands graced the tables with construction paper napkin rings, right. just like teachers would do, and it had a special greeting to the guest. Lindsay, you yes. going to share that? So Mrs. Miller actually has the actual napkin with the napkin ring that has an Irish blessing on it from 1971. I just want to read it to you. Um, it says, "'Tis Irish fantasy to catch a leprechaun and release him for a promise of gold." Tis Irish legend to kiss the Blarney Stone per, for persuasive speech to unfold. Tis the fame of Irish laughter in which you hear the angels sing. And when Irish eyes are smiling, it is truly a morn in spring. Yet the greatest of Irish blessings overshadowing, overshadowing all the rest is our Irish luck that brought you here to be our honored guest. Welcome. And we had quite a day. Now Harriet is going to share the calendar of events for 1966. Okay, the very first year, yes. the <clears throat> antique show, which was sponsored by the Dublin Service League, the father and mother's basketball game, really? the pancake supper, sponsored by the Dublin Exchange Club, which is still a part of the uh, festival, the leprechaun contest, sponsored by the Kiwanis Club, and that's also a an ongoing event. The Irish Stew, sponsored by the American Legion. There was a special church service at the Catholic Church, but all churches were invited or encouraged to have special services on the Sunday of the, uh, of the event. 
the Miss Dublin Beauty Pageant, which was sponsored by the Dublin JCs. And the first beauty pad winner was uh, Beverly Young. She was a beautiful blonde with brown eyes and beautiful. And um, Gail Haskins from Dudley was the runner-up of that uh, first beauty contest. I don't know why Beverly didn't win. I've never figured why she wasn't Miss America because she was so <laughs> beautiful. She played the piano. She, her mother was a piano teacher and Beverly played some uh, George Gershwin uh, numbers, which should have won, you know, you know, but anyway. <laughs> um, at, Central, at Central Elementary School, there was a record hop. Do y'all know what record hops are? No, you don't even know what a record is. Why didn't we bring a record and let them see what a record was? Um, in some ways, they call them the sock hops today. You know what a sock hop is? No, you don't know what a sock used hop to be is. Shinny, the w oh, Shinny. yes. Oh, well, and they still have them, I think, at Trinity sometime. It was a fashion show at Washington Street School, dance at the country club. The citywide sale for the retail merchants, and that was very interesting because they gave. Um, uh, like gift certificates, and they went, they put them all in a box and had a big drawing at the uh, courthouse, and then whoever got the prize winner, but everybody contributed to that, all of them retail merchants, and they had the sales. Um, the VA Medical Center, because of, of Chuck, had a, had a special event every day and an interesting thing is, as it developed, so the Margaret Hill School of Dancing took her girls out there and they sort of had a dress rehearsal for it and the beauty pageant so that they all were a, very much a part of what was going on. Although the people out there were not going to come to the beauty pageant or, any, or go to the dance anyway, but they were very uh, much of it. Bulletin board contests at the, all over the schools. Square dance, you know about square dancing. I've heard a little bit about that. You've heard about square dancing, <laughs> okay. Uh, country music show. Well, country music is getting to be real popular again, so you need to get, get with it, the variety I show. <laughs> um, the, uh, <clears throat> there were just so many uh, events that first year but that it's, it's almost mind-boggling, as Shirley said, to see how everybody came together right then. They just needed direction and leadership, which they got then uh, for the next years, years that it um, went on. Okay, Shirley, that was 66. What now? All right. And as for the key players, we mentioned everyone involved in leadership and activity was considered a key player because, remember, Dick Killebrew's comment, it was the people who would make or break the festival. In Scott Thompson's book, Tales of the Emerald City and the Land of Lawrence, there's a paragraph that I felt so beautifully summarized the festival of Dublin Lawrence County. And he says the festival, which is held over a three week period in March, has grown into the longest celebration of St. Patrick's Day and Irish heritage in the world. Wow. The festival attracts thousands of participants every year, including nationally known parade grand marshals and performers. Among those national personalities, he chose to name Brenda Lee, Vince Dooley, Eileen Fulton, who came in 1973, Danny Davis, and Jimmy Carter. Scott continued Big band leaders like Guy Lombardo, Wayne King, and Von Monroe performed in the late 1960s during this festival time. Oh, and uh, the, the mm -hmm. lieutenant governor at that time was Lester Maddox, and he came yes. and he rode his bicycle backwards in the parade. Really? <laughs> backwards? Wow. Well, Only one who did that. <laughs> I bet. That takes some talent right there. I'm Don Corsell of Dublin Chevrolet. 
The new year means new savings on your favorite Chevys. Save over $5,000 off MSRP on the Chevy Equinox. And remember, Don sells cars well only at Dublin Chevrolet. Hi, I'm uh, Dr. Dustin Gay. I'm a local orthopedic surgeon with Houston Clinic Orthopedics, and we'd really like to invite everybody to come out to our new uh, office facility to take a look at it. It's a larger space with physical therapy, and uh, we're just excited to have it, and we'd love for people to come out and visit us. Come by and see us today at our brand new location, the Houston Clinic Medical Drive in Dublin. Well, there's so many special memories from the, over the years, but another event that's very special to all of us is the awards banquet. Each year, the committee honors outstanding citizens through awards such as Woman of the Year, Man of the Year, Honorary Leprechaun, and many more, Senior Citizen of the Year, and the Amy Cannon Spirit of the Festival Award. And the Youth of the Year. Virginia. And the Youth of the Year, yes. Thank you, Mrs. Miller. The Youth of the Year Award winner. So these individuals display an outstanding volunteer and leadership skills in their community, and they help support the festival in many ways. Mrs. Miller and Mrs. Claxton, you are both recipients of the Woman of the Year Award. Mrs. Claxton, I read that at the time you were named Woman of the Year, you were president of four clubs. You were named Woman of the Year in 1979. You were president of the DAR, president of the Women's Study Club, president of the Dublin Lawrence Fine Arts Association, and president of the Lawrence County Historical Society. Wow, I am sure that you have met so many wonderful people through your many years of ser service. Mm -hmm. And some of these remarkable women you've been able to, to meet and, and know. So can you tell us maybe a few of the, of the past recipients of the Woman of the Year Award? Well, of course, the first uh, recipient was Dorothy Nelson. And we might mention that the first um, awards banquet was made out at the Holiday Inn. It was a luncheon and um, not many people were there because it was just an early thing. But I want to read to you the requirements for Woman of the Year before we talk about them. Great. The Woman of the Year must be over 21 years of age and merit should be attained through service over and above normal duties of her chosen occupation or profession and should include but not be limited to participation in community welfare and development activities, volunteer services in civic, social, or service organizations, active interest and participation in religious affairs, individual service in the community, human relations or individuals and any other areas considered to be meritorious achievement. And I read that because Dorothy Nelson fit all of those. Um, I remember when she was uh, a named Woman of the Year, a remark that I heard was, well, it'll be downhill from now on. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes surely accepted, I think, <laughs> that that might be. <laughs> but Dorothy was active in anything in the community. She was the kind of person who didn't seek any kind of leadership, but if she joined an organization, you made her president because she would be the best it was. And she was, um, for a long time, the uh, director of the Lawrence County Library. She was the, uh, not the director, she was chairman of the board. And she was active to get the li new library building that we have now. Wow. Um, she was uh, in the garden club. The, she was president of the Woman's Garden Club. And to go back in history to her time, the garden clubs were to, so important here. They used to have, the first, they put on shows, a flower show. Have you ever been to a flower show? I have. Well, you know how much work it is. Well, see, they don't do that anymore. Now, the first flower show in Lawrence County was in 1936. But uh, Dorothy uh, was very active in the garden club, mostly as a judge. She was, um, she would judge this, this one and that one and the other. She stayed busy and give programs. Um, she was uh, president of the Parnassus Club, which at the time was a social, um, social service club. Um, she worked with the Cancer Society and all of these other things. 
uh, she was a member of First Baptist Church. She was a Sunday school teacher, Dorothy Nelson Sunday school class. Uh, but her heart was the um, WMU, Woman's Missionary Society. That was her heart. And it broke her heart when things changed in the uh, society. She was uh, an alum of Bessie Tiff College where my mother was. They were not contemporaries, but they were both alums and used to go up to meetings together. I have many fond memories of Dorothy because I've served on many committees with her. And But one thing about her, I remember one Sunday in church a long time ago before we had paid nursery workers, and uh, the preacher said, I don't know who the preacher was, but said, uh, they need a helper in the nursery. They really need a helper in the nursery. I'm sitting there thinking, I sure am glad I'm not in it. <laughs> <laughs> and Dorothy Nelson got up. She was old enough to be my mother, and she went to the nursery and worked. And later I said, Dorothy, how did you do that? And she said, they needed somebody. We understand the value of life, and we want to help you live it to its fullest. At City of Hope Heart and Vascular Center, we're here to make your standard of living our number one priority. Dr. Collins A. Quartang, MD, FACC, FSCAI, is a five board certified cardiologist admired for his empathetic approach to patient care. Dr. K is a former non-commissioned officer of the United States Combat Medical Corps. With the 2nd Infantry Division and the 101st Airborne Division, he's guided by his military values of loyalty, duty, respect, selfless service, honor, integrity, and professionalism. He served his country and now he's here to stay and serve his community. Dr. K specializes in internal medicine, echocardiography, nuclear cardiology, general adult cardiology, and interventional cardiology. Other areas of expertise include acute and chronic heart attack management, peripheral interventions to save legs from being amputated, heart rhythm abnormalities like atrial fibrillation. At City of Hope Heart and Vascular Center, we do your heart right. Call for an appointment today at 478-353-1970. Accepting new patients and walk-ins. Relax Dublin, Dr. K and City of Hope has you covered. Dr. Collins A. Cortang, City of Hope Heart and Vascular Center, 207A Fairview Park Drive in Dublin. And speaking of the flower show, I was teaching at Moore Street School and we were growing hybrid tea roses. And so I was in the uh, Dublin Garden Club and, and they called and asked would I enter a specimen in the show. And I said, well, I really don't know all the requirements. Well, there was a list of things. Oh, you, boy. You, don't you clipped know. it below such and such a notch, and you did this, and you did that. And you seasoned it for so many hours before it was to be accepted in the show. Wow. But I took the time, and I carried it to the Lawrence County Library, a double delight hybrid tea rose from our garden. Wow. And so Lucy Skinner could not wait. It was in Macon. The show was in Macon. And Lucy Skinner came in and she called me and she said, Shirley, you didn't just win the Rose Award, you won the Overall Show Award. I said, brought me a framed picture of the rose that I still have. Beautiful uh, picture. But I said, oh, I'm so excited. I really didn't know how to choose one. She said, you didn't. After you went to school, we went to your garden <laughs> and we cut the one that should have been prepared so <laughs> I had a fun experience with that. Well that, that leads into the next one to Elizabeth Bedingfield. Absolutely. Elizabeth Bedingfield was the big garden and garden lady and rose lady. Yes, okay. well day lilies was her specialty. Well her, her she name. won <clears throat> a uh, sweepstakes flower arrangement of roses one at one of the uh, garden club uh, shows when we had it out at the um, American Legion Hall out on North Jefferson Street. And only somebody who knows about these shows knows. Like Shirley said, that, that bud has to be a certain 
open and open, open and it has to be like this and you have to have leaves that are like this a special way and she had a whole arrangement of it it was wow. breathtaking beautiful this was elizabeth betty yeah this was a little Second, so she was this. So Dorothy Nelson was the first one ever named. Yes. And what year was that? Uh, 1868. Was first. 1968. And Elizabeth Bedingfield was the second, second, the woman of the year for 1969. Right. So many things I learned about her. She was a true patriot who supported those who went to war and those who were left behind. Mm -hmm. She was one of the first to go to Warner Robins to work at the fuse plant. She called in a group of ladies and taught them how to knit. To, they needed sweaters. They needed throws during the war wow. years. And some years later, she built a sun porch onto her house in La Croix Street just to accommodate her knitting group. She loved flowers, as Harriet just said. And, and her niece told me especially daylilies. And she and her sister-in-law, who was Kay Hogan Dominic's mother, graduated from a florist school together. Wow. They went and learned how to do floral arrangements. And Elizabeth was first married to Auburn Uriah Hogan. And when flower sh Rose Flower Shop needed extra hands during seasonal times, they called Elizabeth yeah. to come and help them out. And then Madge, Kay Hogan Dominic's mother, was called to help out at um, uh, the Dublin floral shop with Dot Hall. And that's who Madge went and helped when they had an overflow. Uh, Madge was married to R.C. Hogan Jr., uh, brother to Eli Evelyn Bedingfield's first husband. And, but Evelyn loved education. And Kay told me that she came from a family of professionals, many doctors, a brother was a doctor in her family and that she provided college education for many of her nieces and nephews, although they never had children. So, in 1990, Dorothy Nelson said of her, Elizabeth Bedingfield, she's to be remembered for her contributions in promoting growth and culture of many different plants and shrubs. So she was known for many wonderful things, wasn't she? And you were telling me, and you said that briefly, that she actually knitted Yes. for some soldiers in the war. Yes, and it just, that was an amazing yeah. interest to me. Yeah, yes. amazing woman. Yes. When the power's out, you're out of business. But with natural gas, with the city of Dublin, when the power's out, you can still cook on your gas stove or shower with your gas hot water heater or even fire up the grill. Plus save money every single day because natural gas costs half the price of electricity and propane. Start saving today with the City of Dublin Natural Gas. Call Brad Grimes at 277-5048 and you'll never be out of business with natural gas. I'm Don Carswell, Dublin Nissan. The new year brings new savings on your favorite Nissan. This Dublin Nissan Rogue SV is only 31300 And remember, Don sells cars well, only at Dublin Nissan. All right, Joanne Brinson is my next. The next one was the next year, 1970, right? Yes. Yes, was Mildred Glenn. Mildred <clears throat> Levitt Glenn. Her husband, they moved to Dublin in 1956, hmm? Halsey Levitt. They moved to Dublin, I think it was July the 3rd, 1956. He came with the woolen mill. He was transferred in, uh, he had, I think he had been to, in the Milledgeville plant, and they had been in the plants up in the New England states. He was a Cuban. He, uh, his father had been, was a... Uh, editor of a newspaper there and got sick and they moved to the uh, states and so Halsey really grew up in uh, North Carolina where he met Mildred. Well, <clears throat> uh, they moved to, to Dublin and um, the, as I said, I don't know what day of the week that was, but as Mildred said, it was always, no matter where we went, I 
position that we joined the First Baptist Church the first Sunday. So they came in and they joined the First Baptist Church and that was their home base. They uh, became very active. It wasn't long, of course, that they, he was chairman of the Board of Deacons and Sunday School and he was chairman of, uh, he was Sunday School superintendent and she was this and this and this. But they were very much involved in the community. He was in a Rotary Club, and then he cha yeah, Chamber of Commerce, you name it, Dublin uh, Country Club officer. Um, and Mildred was very, very active in everything. She was became uh, the uh, member of Woman's Study Club, which I might mention that Woman's Study Club was founded in 1912. That is the oldest club in this county. And this is the first year since 1912 that we haven't had meetings. I wasn't here in 1912, but the <laughs> so we've had. I've been a, me, a member for 65 years, but uh, and she is the only person in all those years who served for three years as president. Uh, the rest of us were two-year people. Um, the. Uh, <clears throat> She was a president of the service league. Shirley can tell you about that. And that <clears throat> it's impossible and ungrammatical to say that she was the uniquest person. <laughs> but she is the uniquest person <laughs> I have ever known. <laughs> and and you agree? Yes. yes. She, one time she invited a, a large group of people to come to her her home for a fine dinner. They came and they didn't see any food preparation, but they enjoyed visiting each other and a school bus pulled up. Wow. All of them got into the school bus and she carried them out to dinner to the local restaurant here. Yes, and you don't know about Ma Hawkins, but that <laughs> Ma Hawkins was the local downtown restaurant. Everybody thought it was wonderful. Whatever she did, everybody has a story about Mildred. Fine. And she had a wonderful heart. And, um, and sang a lot. Didn't she come into one of women's study club and, and sang? Began singing. Okay, I was going to mention that she. Uh, okay, <clears throat> the uh, one of the programs that we had talking about the school bus in women's study club was everything you want to know about Dublin. <clears throat> Well, we got down to the meeting, and so she said, well, we were going to take a ride. She had a school bus. So all 30 of us got on this school bus. She had the driver and Scott Thompson, and we went all over Dublin, and she told us about it. We went out to the water plant. We got out and went upstairs. We, she had somebody to tell us all about it. We went to the sewer disposal place. <laughs> we went everywhere there was in Dublin to go. And I'd lived here all those years, but I'd never, never been to those places. But uh, then another program she had for Women's Study Club was um, wartime remembrances. Now, we're talking about... Um, World War II. And the me reason I mention that, I taught school for 50 years. And every night, 50, but every now and then, Five zero. I would say, when I, during the war, we, and of course they wanted to be aggravating, and they'd say, oh, was it, that the revolution, Miss Claxton? I'd say, no, hon, I wasn't here in the revolution. <laughs> I'm talking about World War II. <laughs> but, but anyhow, she and Halsey, married on December the 6th, 1941. So the next day we know what happened. So she followed us through their wartime experiences of letter writing and moving from this camp to this camp and all the things that were happening by singing. And she could not sing, but she sang wonderful wartime songs that you've never heard, White Cliffs of Dover, When the Lights Come Again, Come On Again All Over the World, and Praise the Lord and Pass the Ammunition. <laughs> and it was just a wonderful program, because, and nobody in the world would have done it but Mildred. 
And <clears throat> another thing is that she, she was so much a part of the community. It was like I was reading about the, uh, the uh, requirements. The road races that they had, that we, you can talk to the people who were in the races. I don't know how old she was, but she ran in it, and it was such an event that her picture was on the front page of the Dublin Curie Herald. And I said, Mildred, I, I didn't know that you ran. She said, I don't. And I said, well, that's just wonderful that you did that. She said, I thought everybody was supposed to. And another thing, she, um, she entered uh, the art contest. We didn't, we didn't talk about how later in the development they had sidewalk art shows. And uh, she couldn't paint either, but she won. She you know, wanted, but she expressed herself. That's right. You you know, you're supposed to do these things. We live in this town, and we're supposed to do everything in this town. Uh, her husband, Halsey, was killed in an automobile wreck one December, one Saturday night. And somebody said, well, Mildred, are you going to still live here? And she said, this is my home. So she continued to live here. And there's some question about the, how she got in touch with, what's her name, Lisa? Uh, Eileen. Eileen, okay, but she was Lisa. Lisa. She was Lisa she in it. Was I'm not sure how that worked out, but it, some, some way or other. And asked her about a certain man that she had known in North Carolina. And his name was Fulton Glenn. And they got uh, reacquainted. They had been longtime sweethearts back yonder. He had never married because he was waiting for her. So they married, and it was sort of a, a happy, happy experience. But she, she was unique. Absolutely. She sounds like a woman who despite maybe thinking she couldn't do it, she just tried it and went for it. Because it was a community effort. Right. Absolutely. Whatever. We moved here and this is our home. That's you know. right. Hey, I'm Kyle Farrar with A-plus Flooring and Construction. We're standing in our new showroom that we're going to be opening Monday, February the 8th at 9 a.m. till 4. We're excited about what we have. We have a huge selection. Uh, we're also going to have a lot of great specials. We're going to do 10% off everything in the store for the month of February. We also have a lot of in-stock bargains. We're going to have sheet vinyls, 12 foot wide, 13 six, and 16 wide, all for 55 cents a square foot. We've got LVP glue downs that we're going to be offering for 99 cents a square foot, as well as LVP click that we're going to have for $1.59. So come out, shop with us, don't miss a bargain. From humble beginnings with a desire to serve the Dudley community, Bank of Dudley has grown to five locations, serving Lawrence, Twiggs, and surrounding counties. Serving our community since 1905, the Bank of Dudley is looking forward to its second century of community banking. Drop in today to any of our five locations, Jeffersonville, Dudley, East Dublin, Veterans Boulevard, and Downtown Dublin. Bank of Dudley, member FDIC, and an equal housing lender. That's right. Wonderful. So we're moving on to Joanne Brinson, the 1976 Woman of the Year, and I was honored to know her very personally. She was a visiting teacher for the public schools. She was a true leprechaun because her left hand never knew what her right hand was doing. And he was always giving away anything and everything that she had. If she carried a child to the doctor, the child looked hungry. She carried the child out to eat first. And if the child needed better clothing, she carried the child by her house. And he went to Robbie's closet and got whatever shirt he wanted to wear to the doctor. You know Robbie. Robbie Brinson, Robbie Brinson the dentist. The dentist. Yes. And he told me that one time he went and he opened the closet to get his blue shirt out. He said, Mother, where is my blue shirt? Well, Johnny needed it yesterday when I carried him to the doctor. This is the type of giving person she was. She was a lady of unbelievable generosity. Mm. Right? That's wonderful. I mean, all those, women, all those women of the year, 
that were woman of the year, they were wonderful. Well, and you, you know, you look at the list and some, some names stick, stick out more than others. Um, I was telling my, um, Shirley, Martha Hooks was one. Martha was active in the Garden Club, the Erin Garden Club. Now you got to go way back to 1930s for these garden clubs. The Dublin Garden Club was the oldest garden club, and it was the most prestigious. As you were in the garden, I didn't get in that when I was in Erin. And it had limited membership, and membership only by invitation. And lots of women wanted to get in the Dublin Garden Club and never got in it. But anyway, <clears throat> uh, who am I talking about? Huh? Martha Hooks. Martha. Martha was in Erin Garden Club. And so much about Martha. Mm -hmm. um, and Erin has done so many things. They had the luncheon, the Garden Club luncheon, every two years. I don't know. Okay. And Erin has been very, very, very active. And we, well, and the Erin Garden Club sponsored the fa early fashion shows, too, for the St. Patrick's. Um, but um, she was... Uh, 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 most active in keeping the city from tearing down the Carnegie Library. Wow. They had all kind of plans. After we, she was on the library board with Dorothy Nelson when we got the new library. And um, so they said, well, we don't need that building down there. And it had belonged to the city. And she got on the ball with John Ross and some of the others, and save that building down there. But she, she was a very outstanding person. And another woman who um, is, you know, we talk about a lot during St. Patrick's Festival is Amy Cannon. And um, Mrs. Miller, would you share a little bit about her? Amy was a local beautician. She was past president of the Pilot Club, Sunday school teacher for many, many years. And she was involved with the St. Patrick's Festival from the very, very beginning. If you ever attended a leprechaun contest, it was Amy who was sending the little ones out on stage, patient, kind, loving with her hat on. Yes, yes, this picture of her, right. She also worked with the Grand Ball and the Feast with Fashion, sponsored by the United Methodist Church. But her spirit literally overflowed. She served as president of the Order of the Blarney Stones. She received the 1974 Honor of the Leprechaun Award. She was Woman of the Year in 1977. She was Senior Citizen of the Year in 2004. And like Ann Everly's family, who gave all of her memorabilia to the library, Amy Cannon's family gave all of her treasures to the St. Patrick's Committee, her coat, all of her buttons that she always wore. And did you ever see her dress during St. Patrick's Weeks? Week, every inch of her was stylishly covered with buttons and pins, and her hat was her legacy. Amy Cannon's family in 2015, after her death, in honor of the 50th celebration, and this is the pin of the 50th year, they sponsored the Amy Cannon Spirit of the Festival Award. What an icon she was. But there's such a story for every recipient of every award, from the youth of the year all the way to senior citizens. We wish time permitted to share them all. There are many such Ann Everleys who have never been honored, but this is where you come in. Because a month before the festival, the Courier Herald publishes nomination forms. You can participate. You fill out for a deserving acquaintance. And this spirit of St. Patrick's is absolutely contagious. It brings cheer, it brings fun, it brings memories to others. I attended a graveside service for a friend two days ago. The family member gave the eulogy and he said, my mother-in-law loved the spirit of the St. Patrick's Festival and decorated her house for the month of March equal only to Thanksgiving and to Christmas. But have you ever visited Harry Claxton's house 
during the month of March. Leprechauns greet you from every room, and not just one, but hundreds. So breathe deeply, my friend, because every year about this time, the spirit of St. Patrick's fills the air in Dublin and Lawrence County. Absolutely. It's nothing personal. It's just business. Hello? That's how some people do things. Right away. To us, everything we do is personal. Because anyone can answer the call. It's who shows up that matters most. That's the quality of your independent agent. And the company that stands behind them. Ask Curry Maffet Insurance in Dublin if auto owners make sense for you. Hey, I'm Glenn Register with Hometown Supply, and with the new year comes a new commitment for all of us here at Hometown Supply. We are committed to providing you with quality products and service on our full line of new and used appliances. We also offer service on most any brand of appliance on the market today. So if you need repairs on appliance, just give us a call here at Hometown Supply. And remember, if you can't do business here, you just can't do business. We just can't wait to, to have that again next year when we can all celebrate together with the large festival gatherings, and which is why we want to share this history because we want to keep the spirit of the festival alive. And a woman who did a really great job of that and who we can actually thank for that, in addition to these women sharing their stories, um, was Miss Ann Everly, who Mr. Shirley touched on in the beginning. Um, I wanted to share an article that I came across from an, um, that was written in the Career Herald by Scott Thompson in 2015, and it was titled, Anne Everly, the First Lady of the St. Patrick's Festival. Um, she was recognized in 1978 by the Blarney Stones, but she was never recognized as Woman of the Year or Senior Citizen of the Year. And I'm just going to read what Scott shared here. So Scott shares that Miss Everly was a single mother who recently moved back to Dublin to raise her family. She worked at WMLT and was eager to get involved in the community in her hometown. She is known to many as the St. Patrick Festival's first historian. She kept detailed records of the festival. For four decades, Miss Everly saved every scrap of paper related to the festival. She was the historian of the festival from the very first day. Her records are now kept at the Lawrence County Historical Society. It includes clippings, programs, tickets, photos, and all sorts of history and memorabilia through the years. And Scott says here, she was the first woman who worked tirelessly behind the scenes while the founding fathers were lauded with plaques and awards. She was Ann M. Everly, the first lady of the Dublin Lawrence St. Patrick's Festival. So I just wanted to share that story and, and I just think, thank you ladies for, for sharing about those, those other women of the year. And as we conclude this portion of history of the festival, I wanted to share with you one more story. Well, actually, Mrs. Claxton is going to share with you one more story, and that's the history of the man, St. Patrick, the man who our, our festival is named after. And Mrs. Claxton has done research on him, so would you mind sharing with us oh, about well, that? Oh, well, I've done research, but this happens to be a poem that Shirley wrote years ago as a uh, invitation to our Woman of the Year luncheon that we have had for many, many years now. And uh, it, it's just a high point of our experience. And <clears throat> the uh, <clears throat> it's a wonderful little club because you don't pay dues and you don't have to do anything. And, uh, you know, it's not a do-good thing. But when one of our members uh, dies, we put a book in the library in her memory. And so during the past year, we have had one to die, and that was uh, Jane Bell. And uh, so we have a book in the library for her. So it has been a, a very fun kind of group because it's always pretty and everybody wears green. We have good food and uh, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, <clears throat> I want to share something personal and I sure, ask Shirley too. Shirley, do you remember the event when you became uh, a Woman of the Year? And I also want to say that Shirley received the Amy Cannon Spirit Award, but we also had um, Lucy Skinner, another member of Woman's first. Study Club, who uh, received the uh, Amy Cannon Award. She was the very first one to receive Lucy Award. She, she was the first one, and you, then you, but 
of the members, you too, okay. All right, do you remember when you were named Woman of the Year? 86, 19. Do you remember anything about it? You said we all had a story to oh, tell. No, 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 my, my story is, I has been told. Just to That's enough, it. well, I'm gonna tell mine. Okay, certainly. Okay. Certainly. This lovely young lady, I could tell from her voice, kept calling my house wanting to speak to Mr. Claxton. And I kept saying, well, Mr. Claxton isn't here. And can I help you? No, I can't help you. So finally she kept doing it and I said, I am Mrs. Claxton and I will be glad to help you if you uh, want me to. And she said, no, this is personal business with Mr. Claxton. And I said, let me tell you something, young lady. <laughs> you don't have any personal business with Mr. Claxton. <laughs> and don't you call back. <laughs> and she never called back. Some way or other, she got in touch with him and brought me out here. So that's my little story. <laughs> Couldn't match that. They were trying to keep it from you. They were going. And it was a surprise. Yeah. It was. An invitation we send, and you hasten to say, a shepherd and lambs for St. Patrick's Day. Yes, for Ireland's patron saint at the age of 16 was kidnapped by Irish pirates, which changed the scene of his life in Britain that had been filled with great wealth. Now a slave and a shepherd, perhaps endangered health. It was during these years that he turned to prayer 100 times a day and always found God there. He dreamed of a ship waiting on a shore and ran away from his captors seeking more of God's will for his life. He sailed to France, there entering the priesthood, not mere circumstance, for God had great plans for young Patrick, you see, whose childhood had been built on Christianity. For just a short visit, he went home again to Britain, where a vision led, he, led him back to the land that once had held him captive. Come and walk free among us, our shepherd, now you will be. 300 churches, we are told, Patrick helped start. 120,000 persons gave Jesus their heart. St. Patrick brought the Latin language to Ireland as well, and the art of reading and writing his own book tales. Such gifts to a country last on and on for centuries after this saint has been gone. You are invited, an invited guest for St. Patrick's Day based on the part of your life that you too gave away. Wow, wonderful, and, and you wrote that. Wonderful. Well, ladies, thank you so much for all that you do in the community over all these years, for chronicling these, these stories, for taking the time to research them and to share them with us all today. And I, we just, I feel like it's so important that we get those stories and share them. Um, they are such a big part of the festival in our community, and we're just so grateful that you've come here today and, and told those. Is there anything else that you'd like to share today? Well, it's just wonderful for you all to do this, and I hope next year now you're going to be able to have the festival as it should be. Yes, absolutely. We are all looking forward to gathering again in 2022. And so I hope you enjoyed this, uh, this segment with the history of the St. Patrick's Festival. And I hope you have a great month. And we hope that you celebrate in your own way safely. And remember, Aaron Go Bra. Hi, this is Cameron Curry with Kim Barr, and we're the Vice Chairs of the 2021 Dublin Lawrence St. Patrick's Festival. We would like to thank the Dublin Lawrence community and all of our sponsors, patrons, vendors, and civic organizations for their continued support of the Dublin Lawrence St. Patrick's Festival through the years. It's because of your financial support each year that allows us to celebrate our great city. Erin Gobra. Go